Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you all to the Tanuva Global Veterinary Home of Critical Care and Emergency Webinar Series 3 on clinical exploration and management of cardiopulmonary emergencies in government care. Now, I invite Dr. S. Balasubramanian, Director of Clinics, Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, to deliver the welcome. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, Professor Dr. K. N. Silvakumar, the Organizing Secretary, Dr. Arun Prasad, Head of the Resident Veterinary Services Section, the Co Organizing Secretaries, Dr. Vijay Kumar, First Head of Veterinary University Peripheral Hospital, Madhavaram Chennai, and uh, Dr. Vijayananda Ashton Professor, VUPH, Madhavaram Chennai. And uh, our uh, international speaker, <coughs> who's a product of Tanua, <laughs> Dr. Bhagi Sheshadri, who's a double board certified practitioner in US. So, good evening to all the veterinary undergraduate, postgraduates, faculty members, field and practicing veterinarians worldwide. And uh, a very good morning to Ravi Sheshadri. So Thank you. maybe maybe after more than three decades, I am seeing Ravi Sheshadri. <laughs> nice to see. And uh, somehow we managed to get you for this uh, Danuas Global Webinar on Trauma and Critical Care Emergency, Webinar C3 of 2021. This is the, the first one in this particular, uh, after our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, has assumed office. So, uh, in and we have the right person for this particular uh, topic. So, I once again take it uh, as a privilege to welcome all the participants for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I invite Dr. K. N. Sagurkumar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Tamil Nadu Veterinary Animal Sciences University, to deliver the special event. Good evening and good morning, Dr. Ravi Sheshatri, who is going to share this experience on an expertise on veterinary and emergency critical care. Dr. Balasubramaniam, Diet of Clinics, Tanuvas, and my dear participants. I'm happy to be part of this global webinar series three on veterinary trauma and critical care emergency. The Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences University is well known for its clinical excellence and the range of veterinary services offered. Madras Veterinary College Teaching Veterinary Hospital is the country premier veterinary hospital with dedicated specialty units committed to diagnosis, treatment and management of clinical problems. Professional development is an essential component and one needs to update their knowledge continuously. Continuing veterinary education is a must to update knowledge of veterinarians working in academic institutions, animal veterinary department, NGO and in various fields. As part of the continuing veterinary education, this global webinar on clinical explication and management of cardio pulmonary emergencies in dog and cats is being organized today. I'm very happy to participate in this. Trauma and critical care emergency or intensive care is done through intensive monitoring and aggressive treatment with basic life support and critical care in order to stabilize the critically ill patient, thereby saving the life of animals. Pets have become an integral part of the family and it creates a lot of social benefit also. <clears throat> Pet parents seek for the best of treatment and at times an emergency, unlike hospice care, where a pet is supported and kept comfortable during the end stages of life, the goal of critical care is to use all avenues of treatment to give patient the best chance of survival. Advances in veterinary critical care have made it possible to treat 
the emergencies, especially in dog and cats. Advanced monitoring and therapy in trauma care could include catheterization, blood flow monitoring and blood transfusion, bleeding control, ventilation support, nutritional support, pain control, dialysis, management of hypothermia or shock. It's happy to note that the gadget needed for successful and specialized emergency care of the critically ill beds are available in all the teaching veterinary hospitals of Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Research University. These procedures are skilled and require specialization. Moreover, advancements in this field are rapidly progressing and keeping update of new information is essential. And I'm happy that this global webinar has been planned with the objective of such knowledge sharing from the experts. An update in the management of cardiopulmonary emergencies is organized today, which is open to veterinary students, both undergraduate and postgraduate, faculty members, and practicing veterinarians. I'm happy to note that Dr. Ravishya Shatri, Diplomat in American Board of Veterinary Practitioner, Diplomat in Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care, United States of America, is an aluminium Madras Veterinary College, also in 1988, and a double board certified critical care specialist present in this webinar. We welcome you, sir. You. After the COVID-19 pandemic, online education has become inevitable and has been a valuable source of knowledge input accessible from anywhere and any time. The director of clinics, Tanuvas, has taken the lead in organizing 10 global webinars with 19 international speakers including during the pandemic period for imparting quality continuing education in the field of veterinary clinical science. And I'm very happy to note today there are 32 international participants from eight countries like Malaysia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Poland, Sri Lanka, Italy, Qatar, Taiwan. And within India, there are 1,053 participants from 31 states. Really a good number of uh, participants. And I take this opportunity to inform the Directorate of Clinics and Director were presented with an award of excellence for outstanding contribution during COVID-19 pandemic and Corona Warrior in Veterinary Field 2021, respectively by Alamic Pharmaceutical Limited. I congratulate the Director of Clinics, Tanwas, and his entire team for organizing the global webinar and insist the student and practitioner to make use of this opportunity to the fullest extent possible. I wish you all a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I invite Dr. A. Arun Prasad, President Veterinary Officer and Head, President Veterinary Services Section, Madras Veterinary College, to introduce the speaker of today's webinar. A very good evening to the delegates and the participants, and good morning to the speakers, and greetings to all. Uh, Dr. Ravi Sastri was uh, born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to parents in academia. His father was an Aston Rosa at Canary Mellon University. He was flying with the most of his primary through college education in India and traveled extensively as a child or young adult over India. Dr. Sheshatri has completed his veterinary degree at Madras Veterinary College uh, during 1983 to 1988. He went on to complete ECF BG, Educational Commission for Foreign Veterinary Graduates Certificate Program in 1989, which involved the first step to have license to practice in US. And then initially started working at a small animal practice in Antico, California, while, traveled, while trying to get into residency program. In late 1990s, he moved to Sukal to start an alternate pathway residency in emergency and critical care. While working at All Cat Animals Referral Center, uh, he was exposed to amazing clinicians and was able to signify, improve his skill set and knowledge. Base. So Dr. Shastri has completed a board certification in small animal practice in 1996 and has 
uh, recertified since the unmaintained current certification. He has also completed uh, requirements for critical care residency and passed boards in 1999, becoming the 28 uh, diplomat certified. In 2000, uh, Saad has, was a part of a group of veterinarians that started Advanced Veterinary Specialist Group, uh, 50,000 square feet collaborative multi speciality practice. Uh, and he was, uh, Saad was head heading the uh, group that is the uh, ACCIM, the Critical Care and Internal Medicine portion, uh, which has got a level one. Uh, certified uh, hospital with an extraordinary and with an extraordinary successful. He has also trained a lot of residents. He worked there as at around uh, ten years in uh, uh, advanced veterinary specialist group. So Dr. Shastri also was a founding partner of the City of Angels Veterinary Specialist Center in Calgary City in 2007. In 2008-9, Sal had moved to after starting AVC, that is Advanced Veterinary Care in Salt Lake City, Park City, Utah. Uh, and this was an again, this was an again a multi speciality hospital with a level one certification, and so was uh, heading and it was chief until 2008. This, this practice is currently a pathway veterinary associate uh, practice, and he uh, worked until uh, May 2021. So, and he had uh, uh, after his contract, uh, he had left the uh, AVC, and he almost worked for 11, 11 years and 11 months at AVC. And as far as Dr. Shasti have served on the residency committee training uh, uh, committees, the appeals committee and the examination committee of American College of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care and also chaired the exams committee for two years. And he was honored with American College of Critical Care Medicine as a fellow in 2017. And he has an interest on uh, diversified and uh, enjoyed emergency and critical care and also uh, internal, uh, it, does, it do not have an internal delineation between these cases. He was comfortable with surgical cases, management of soft tissues, and he was also uh, trained in uh, imaging techniques on ultrasound and echocardiography. And Saad is more proficient in minimally invasive procedures and enjoyed uh, basic stunts, interventional uh, procedures, and he is so well versed with that one. So it is uh, uh, the time that we have uh, Saad for this presentation, which is a very good uh, uh, initiation of this program. And uh, he was now currently employed with the Southern or uh, Oregon Veterinary Specialty Center in the Central Point, uh, Oregon, USA. So, do is uh, this why uh, he has published uh, a lot of quality research paper in high impact journals like Veterinary Surgery, Journal of American Hospital Animal Hospital Association (JVEC), JVECC, etc. So, to uh, to name some uh, utilization of continuous renal replacement therapy in a case of perine and acute renal failure, one of the topic. And therapeutic plasma paralysis in case of immune mediated thrombocytopenia, yeah, hemolytic anemia, is as a paper, uh, which is a renowned journal, and accuracy of formulas used to predict post transfusion uh, axial volume rise in anemic cases. And to uh, complement, uh, Saad is being a very good cricketer. I uh, hear that uh, Saad used to play a very good cricketer along with our uh, uh, director of clinics, while in our. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he is a specialist uh, in diplomat in uh, ABVP, Canine and Feline Practice, and diplomat SEVE, and a fellow of Veterinary Care Medicine, American College of Veterinary Medicine, Care Medicine. So I thank our Vice Chancellor Danos for his uh, August presence and raising this occasion, and also I thank our uh, Director of Clinics, Danos, for giving this opportunity. Uh, thank you, sir, and uh, over to Dr. Ravi, sir, for the webinar presentation. I welcome you, sir. So it got met in place over a period that we started by now, but it's us, I think so. And now it has time that we have got met in place, so we have a webinar with you. We are happy to be with you. Thank you. Good morning, good morning from my perspective. Good evening to everybody in, in, in Asia. Um, good day to the people in Europe. My name is Ravi Sishadri, and I'm a practicing emergency critical care clinician. And I'm very, very glad to be here this morning. The subject matter is very, very large. I had to figure out how best to present it and be comprehensive, but at the same time try and touch on the basic philosophy of why we treat patients in a certain manner. So what I did was I started off by going into the pathophysiology of cardiopulmonary disease a little bit and then picked out select topics because of the size of the subject I, I'm touching on topics. I'm not going into much detail. 
And then the goal is, in the question and answer session, I will we'll do free form and I'll answer any question that I can. If I can't answer the question for you off the fly, I will get you the answers. So why do we worry about cardiopulmonary function? Cardiopulmonary function is what fundamentally delivers oxygen. And patients die when they're in shock. Shock is dis defined as the mismatch between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. Oxygen delivery is always listed as DO2, and oxygen consumption or uptake is called VO2. That DO2 to VO2 relationship differs across different tissue beds. So, for example, if you were going to go ahead and look at a patient at the level of the brain, the DO2 to VO2 is preserved as long as cerebral perfusion pressure is preserved. On the other hand, if you look at the splanchnic circulation, when you go into shock and the body shifts to core body circulation, the splanchnic areas are not oxygenated very well. Your DO2 to VO2 drops quite a bit. And this creates, for example, in a GDV situation, reperfusion injury when you come back and are able to oxygenate those tissue beds. So it's really, really important to realize that the DO2 to VO2 is not globally preserved across our patient. There are certain beds where it's preserved, there are other beds where it's not preserved. And because we're talking about the metabolic processes, we're not talking about the cellular processes, we're going to limit ourselves to the D2 side. In other words, how do we keep animals alive by maximizing oxygen delivery? We're not going to worry so much about, did this patient get into cyanide that's blocking uptake of oxygen at the cellular level? Or does this patient have carbon monoxide poisoning? So even though the heart and lungs are working well, there's, there's no oxygen being downloaded at the tissue beds. So we're talking only about the cardiopulmonary side during this lecture. So the delivered oxygen is related to the product of cardiac output and the oxygen content of blood. Your cardiac output is a function of your stroke volume and your heart rate. On the other hand, your oxygen content of blood is the sum of both the free oxygen in the blood, the dissolved oxygen, plus the oxygen being carried by the hemoglobin molecule. So in each hemoglobin molecule can carry four molecules of oxygen under normal healthy circumstances. So this can be represented by this formula, which everybody was probably forced to memorize in your first year and have probably forgotten by now. But essentially it says your oxygen content of blood is 1.34 times the hemoglobin times the oxygen saturation of your hemoglobin. And then your dissolved oxygen is, is, is defined by PaO2 times 0031. And so that tells you that the dissolved oxygen component of oxygen delivery is minimal. So when you increase, when you apply a face mask of oxygen to a patient who's in distress, you're actually counting on the hemoglobin to move that oxygen. So if that patient is also anemic, even though you may be applying a face mask of oxygen, your oxygen delivery is not improving significantly. Net result is, if you have an anemic patient where you want to try and increase oxygen delivery, you'll have to think of either getting red cells into that patient or talking about other alternative methods which honestly are not very practicable, like extracorporeal membrane oxygenators or using hyperbaric oxygen to try and increase the oxygen content of blood. When you use hyperbaric oxygen, you, because your oxygen is at two atmospheres instead of one, patients in a chamber, that formula of 0 0.0031 times the dissolved oxygen changes quite a bit because your dissolved oxygen jumps up by a two or three factor. The oxygen carrying capacity in, in, is, the hemo, is primarily influenced by the hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin um, ability to carry oxygen then becomes a function of saturation, which means you need to have good lungs, you have to have good gas exchange for this to happen. You, you probably all remember the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. 
The important thing to remember about this is that when you have patients in illness states, when they're febrile, when their 2,3-DPG numbers are changed, these patients have a harder time carrying oxygen to their tissues. Um, again, not something that has to be memorized. Just remember that when you have a patient who is ill, there are more, there's more than one cause for oxygen delivery to be impaired. Cardiac output, like we said earlier, is a product of stroke volume and heart rate. Your stroke volume is dependent on preload. That is the amount of blood that comes from the atrium into the ventricle. Starling's law says that when you have adequate filling of the left ventricle, the ventricle has the best contractile capacity. So if you have an underfilled ventricle, it doesn't contract very well. And when you have an overfilled ventricle, it doesn't contract very well. The stroke volume is also dependent on your afterload. So if you have, for example, an aortic stenosis, it doesn't matter how much preload you have, that, that ventricle cannot push much blood through the stenotic aorta. by looking at fractional shortening or by looking at your myofibril tightening with echocardiogram, and your contractility varies in disease states. A stunned myocardium, a patient immediately after a cardiac arrest, has decreased contractility compared to a healthy patient. Contractility is also affected by what's called rheology. So if you have blood that is extremely dilute, that is extremely that blood is easy to pump, but it doesn't have, it leaks through the valves much easier. If you have blood that's extremely hemoconcentrated, say a PCV of 60% in a patient with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea, that blood again is much harder for the patient to pump because it pumps like molasses. The ideal rheology in patients is going to be somewhere around 30%. The heart rate is controlled by the autonomous nervous system. And to that, in order to have that function properly, your electrical signaling system has to work correctly. If you have a bundle branch block, if you have an AV block, you are not going to have a rate that is sustainable with good cardiac function. Also, the rate has to be within a normal range. Dogs cannot keep pumping if you keep increasing the heart rate requirements. One of the ways to create dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs is to artificially pace their heart and get them into the 220s for about four months. And that creates a very nice dilated cardiomyopathy model because the, because the myocardium just starts to fail over time. So it's really important that the rate that you create and, and you, me, the veterinarian creates is a function of actually controlling the rate that the patient in shock is going through. So if you have a dog who's extremely painful, his heart rate is starting to climb, giving an opioid is going to reduce the pain. By reducing the pain, you're going to make the rate come down. That's going to improve cardiac function. So going back to the same concept, um, once we've gone through all of this, there's an ideal range of heartbeat beyond which, you know, when you increase the rate, you only decrease the stroke volume and you increase the myocardial oxygen consumption. And it's important for all of us to remember that a small dog or a small cat is going to have a higher rate. So a patient who's, say, somewhere in the four to five kilo range would be perfectly happy at 160 to 180 heart rate. A patient who's somewhere in the 60 to 70 kilo range, like a big Great Dane, is probably trending towards heart failure at 160. Those patients are going to be better between 120 and 140. So rates don't apply across the board to our species. They apply across the board proportionally to our species. And normal heart rates have been documented in, in, in a lot of different textbooks, but um, it's a clinical judgment at some fundamental level. So when you look at cardi cardiopulmonary emergencies, in this, in this situation, you can pretty much say, is this dog's problem, is this cat's problem an issue of oxygen transport because of the heart or is it an issue of oxygen transport because of the lung? So either cardiac or respiratory. And the earlier you differentiate this, the better it is because if you can get this answered quickly, then your outcomes are a little bit better. Most dogs will present the same way. 
most cats will present the same way. They're in distress. They may or may not be drooling. They're orthopnic, which means that they're holding their elbows abducted, they're holding their neck extended, and they're working really, really hard to breathe. These patients in shock have pallor, they have poor perfusion, and their heart rate varies. Cats can have low heart rates in failure. Dogs can have extremely high heart rates in failure. And they always have increased effort. And the quicker you intervene, the better they do. So we're going to talk about a few cases, airway disease, lung disease, low output heart failure, and VQ mismatch. And these are kind of like the concepts that we want to cover over the next hour or so. So when you talk about an airway patient, they usually have increased rate and effort. They're orthopnic, they have stertor, which is that nasal noise that you hear, or strider, which is the laryngeal noise that you hear. If you have most of that's intrathoracic disease. So that would be tracheal collapse or small airway disease. And some of these diseases are breed specific. So if you have a brachycephalic dog, you can pretty much count on it having an upper airway problem. If you have a dog like a Pomeranian or Chihuahua, you tend to look at the lower airway. So when you have the, 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 in this practice, that is in the Oregon practice and in the Salt Lake practice, the number one airway emergency that we saw were brachycephalic dogs. And these dogs almost invariably present the same way. The weather is usually poor, so people don't take these dogs out. They sit around the house, and then when the sun starts to shine and, the, and, the, and summer comes on, people take these dogs out for a long walk, and they decompensate. They decompensate about half a mile into the walk, but the owners have already gone out in one direction, and they can't stay in that direction. So they, they, they refuse to you know, just come straight back to the car carrying the dog, so they walk the dog back to the car, and then they show up at the hospital. So here's a little video clip of a brachycephalic obstructive airway dog that's in severe distress. And you can see that when this patient is trying to breathe, he's not moving a lot of air. He's working really, really hard. And the amount of air that you move from your lungs plays a big role in our ability to regulate our heat. It plays a, it plays a bigger role in dogs and cats because dogs and cats don't sweat, whereas people sweat. So if you have a brachycephalic airway patient who's going into failure, a lot of times they become extremely hyperthermic. They get arrest from, they get respiratory or cardiac arrest either from hypoxia or from thermal injury, both of which affect the brain. And they get the, the therapy requires that you have to capture the airway. So you have to sedate them right away, place an endotracheal tube, get them on fluids, and then once they're more stable, talk about surgically fixing their airway. And if you don't have a surgical capacity in the hospital, one option is to keep the endotracheal tube in place, keep the patient sedated if you have a surgeon nearby who can fix it, or the other option would be to consider doing a temporary tracheostomy until the airway can be fixed. Um, these guys, can the, the surgical fixation is not technically difficult. It takes time to learn it because there's very little room to work in the back of the larynx, in the back of the oropharynx, but essentially the palate has to be resected to where it's just touching the epiglottis, and if the saccules are everted, they need to be removed. Um, using a ligature makes all of that much, much easier. We expect these guys to overall do pretty well. Once their airway is open, they can breathe much, much better. And the biggest thing that you worry about with these patients is that you have to look for comorbidities. Some of them have pneumonias because they've aspirated. Some of them are overweight. Some of them have, because of their breeding, have co concurrent uh, pulmonic stenosis. So these patients you have to look at, and make sure they don't have a comorbidity, that your surgery goes great, but the animal never leaves the hospital because it's so sick that, you know, it doesn't survive the whole process of ICU care. 
Um, it's usually seen, like I said, in anatomically challenged patients. So we're talking about French Bulldogs, English Bulldogs, boxers. Um, starting from the top, the nares play a role, stenotic nares, elongated saft palate, everted saccules, and the pharyngeal collapse. It can have just one or it can have all. Pharyngeal collapse patients don't do very well. Essentially, they've had so much stress over time, even if you're able to repair it, um, the dog will just have swelling, or in some cases, the pharynx will just keep collapsing in on itself. So if you pull it over to one side with suture, the other side of the larynx will follow, and the airway just never opens very well. Um, the younger the patient, the better they do. And, and the reason for this is when, when you have a lot of respiratory effort over time. Bernoulli's tends to make all those tissues fold inward. And if you do correct them when they were relatively young, between six months and a year and a half, then they don't get into a crisis. If you wait till they're eight or nine and now they're turning blue, you, when you fix them, sometimes they just don't have a strong enough pharynx and the pharynx starts to collapse and it doesn't go well. If you have pharyngeal collapse, you need a permanent tracheostomy. You cannot do any surgery at the larynx and have a good outcome. You just have to do a permanent tracheostomy. The biggest problem with permanent tracheostomies is, one, they get recurrent pneumonias because there's no barrier to dust and bacteria getting in. People sometimes, unfortunately, will drown because they don't realize that they can't go in water and they will run into uh, water and then they will immediately drown. So. It takes a very, very dedicated owner to keep a permanent tracheostomy patient alive. Somebody would have to, uh, who keeps the dog inside the house, who keeps the tracheal site cleaned every day, twice a day, and um, who watches them for pneumonias very, very uh, closely. When you have laryngeal paralysis, which is the other kind of issue that you have at the upper airway, um, this usually occurs with geriatric large breed dogs. Fundamentally, the recurrent laryngeal nerve innervates both the arytenoids. The muscles that pull back the arytenoids are given a synchronous signal by the recurrent laryngeal nerve at the time of inhalation. So the larynx is supposed to open when you inhale and supposed to be closed when you're trying to drink water or eat food. As these dogs get older, the recurrent laryngeal nerve becomes less functional. It's a geriatric issue and it's called laryngeal paralysis tapping sound when they bark. Um, huskies have a, for some reason an idiosyncratic juvenile or early onset laryngeal paralysis but most of the other breeds you'll see this between 9 and 12 years of age. Pneumonia obviously is a comorbidity because when your larynx doesn't function right, you aspirate. Uh, surgical repair is the only option. If you have a dog that you don't have a surgeon available, you can intubate them, get them through the crisis. Once they're through the crisis, you can go ahead and uh, try and extubate them. You can put them on butorphanol or, or hydrocodone to keep keep their keep them calm. You can go ahead and give them a drug called doxepin. Um, there's some anecdotal evidence that doxepin might help uh, keep the larynx more functional. It has not been proven. There's no double-blinded studies out there. Um, and laryngeal paralysis has been associated with hypothyroidism. We do not know if this association is causative or just casual. The next level of airway issues is going to be the airway issue. And this clip is not mine, it's from YouTube. Um, and it's going to take a second 
So it occurs very commonly in toy breeds, and it's sometimes accompanied by liver disease. On that little fluoroscopic clip, you saw that the trachea was collapsing down to minimum uh, to millimeters. And what happens is the trachea is made up of cartilage. Cartilage weakens over time in these patients. Some of these patients have concurrently Cushing's disease or have been exposed to a lot of steroids because they're itchy. And the steroids also tend to weaken the cartilage. That weakening of the cartilage tends to make the trachea collapse. First, it starts off with a dor redundant dorsal tracheal membrane, and then over time, it becomes a complete collapse. You can start managing them medically when they are young. As they get older and the collapse progresses, you, in you invariably have to manage them surgically. In the medical management side, there have been a couple of articles that say that using Stanzolol or Winstrol might be helpful in keeping preserving tracheal function. Article came out of Greece. Again, not, not, has not been checked in a double-blinded manner, um, so we're not 100% sure that that's a valid option. We try to use inhaled steroids over oral steroids because that reduces the steroid load on the patient. Uh, we put them all on bronchodilators. If there's a bacterial component, we put them on a course of antibiotics, either doxycycline or, or something similar. Um, and we put them on cough suppressants because if you suppress the cough, these dogs tend to do better. It's really important that they stay at a healthy weight. The more obese they get, the more the trachea collapses. If you start to see a grade four collapse where the patient is showing cyanosis, so if you exert the dog, he starts to cough like that, and then his tongue and lips start to look a little bit cyanotic, or if you start to see syncope where the patient is actually um, having collapsing episodes where they lose consciousness, then you need to place a stent. It's done with a, it's done with fluoroscopy. Um, if fluoroscopy is not available and you have an X-ray unit that is um, that can give you a very quick turnaround on a plate detector. So we're talking about um, not a CR system, but more a DR system. Um, then you might be able to do it. Essentially, what you need to do is these stents are specifically designed for each patient. They are sized to the patient correctly. In, inappropriate stent sizing leads to failure. Either you can necrose the trachea or you can have a transstent that's sliding in the trachea. And because it's sliding, it, it just worsens the cough and doesn't achieve what you want it to do. And then after the stent is placed, these patients still cough. They're not coughing because they can't breathe, but they're coughing because they feel something in their airway that is that wasn't there. And it takes about six to eight weeks for the mucosa to incorporate the stent. So during that period of time, they usually need medical management. I'm sorry. So this is a set of films a dog with a grade four collapse that now has a stent in place. And you can see that the stent is sized to be about a centimeter or so beyond the higher apparatus. And you want to keep it uh, about the level of the third rib. Um, at the fourth rib, you, you start to see the uh, first bronchus come off the on the right side. So if you, if you go past the fourth rib, you will actually entrap the bronchus. The bronchus won't get air, and you'll end up with having a lobar consolidation on those patients. So this is a pretty ideally placed stent in this patient. Then we go from the air wall. Um, the biggest things we see in this in these patients is the ones that have classic wall or pleural space issues, and then the ones that have issues with gas. So when we talk about the pleural space, the number one cause of death for pleural space injury is going to be attention pneumothorax. Attention pneumothorax is a traumatic pneumothorax or pneumothorax where air can be inhaled into the lung, goes into the pleural space injury, and that flap prevents the air from being expelled when the patient works hard to breathe. These patients blow up like a balloon very, very quickly, and they die. 
Um, you can also get regular pneumothoraxes. Regular pneumothoraxes take longer. Again, they could be traumatic or non-traumatic, uh, but they don't die as acutely as the pleural space disease patients. You can get pyothorax, much more common in the cat than the dog. You can get pleural effusions from heart failure, hypoalbuminemia, neoplasia, or perineoplastic causes, chylothorax, vasculitis, etc. And for all of these conditions, ultrasound actually is much faster than x-ray. So if you have a dog coming in in respiratory distress where you cannot hear lung sounds, don't look for the x-ray unit. Look for ultrasound if you have it on site. You can go ahead and tap them. If you don't hear any lung sounds at all, you can do an empirical thoracocentesis. Sometimes that can save their lives. You may be pulling off air, you may be pulling off fluid, you don't know, but if they're in distress, that's something that you should consider. This cat has a classic plural space breathing pattern. This is something that you should be able to recognize. You can see the And the majority of the excursion is not the thorax, but the abdominal wall. She's compensating the best she can, but she's in pretty she's in pretty significant distress. When we talk about ultrasound. And this, in the U.S., there are tons of courses available. I'll, I'll put one in a hyperlink, but you can definitely have the teaching hospitals, you know, go through this process, teach the outgoing uh, batches as ultrasound is available. Um, and these patients, the big advantage is you ultrasound them in a sternal position, so you're not trying to move them around. You're not trying to put them on their back. There's no increase in patient stress. And you're looking for what are called B lines, which talks about lung water. You're looking for a presence of air. Air does not allow ultrasound to penetrate. So if you have a chest full of air, you will just see bright air behind the ribs and then no further signal beyond that. Fluid, on the other hand, is extremely dark. Large amounts of fluid will be floating. Accident. So ultrasound is the easier way to diagnose primary pleural space disease. And if you have that, then um, you have to go ahead and if ultrasound and x-ray are not available, um, you, if they're open mouth breathing, you can give them a little bit of orphanol as a mild sedative and a G-sick. And then you listen to them with a stethoscope carefully. And then you find the spot where you can really hear no lung sounds and consider sentencing that area. Um, if it's fluid, you would sentence them lower down. So you'd sentence them at the level of the intercostals or below that. If it's air, you'd sentence them higher up. So somewhere around the upper third of the chest between uh, rib nine and rib 11 would be a good place to sentence air if you think a patient has a lot of air in the chest. Once the thorax is drained to negative pressure, their ventilation improves. You have to analyze whatever fluid you got from there. If it's a pneumothorax, you have to identify whether it's spontaneous or traumatic or neoplastic. Then you, need, you have to talk about definitive care. Surgery is going to be required. You may need a, to go in and remove either a mass or a bulla. And in some cases of pneumothorax, traumatic pneumothorax, you can do what is called a blood patch. Essentially what you're doing is you have a patient that maybe got hit by a car, has a pneumothorax that keeps refilling. You've got, you've drained this dog three or four times. He's not improving. You can put a chest tube in this patient, drain the patient, keep the patient to negative pressure with a chest tube, see if that works. If it doesn't work, then you want to try and seal that without putting the dog through surgery. You draw up to 20 mils of blood from this patient, from the as long as the patient is not anemic, you can actually draw 20 mils per kilogram body weight off of the patient, um, and then you can always transfuse them later if you need to, or you can draw seven depending on what your comfort level is. If you have an unstable patient, or if you have a patient that you think 
needs all of the oxygen carrying capacity, then you draw just seven mils per kilogram body weight, and then you go ahead and you it back through the chest tube and you move the patient into the, all four positions, dorsal, external, left lateral recumbency, right lateral recumbency. The goal is for the blood to go and coat the muscles, and it is a single area that's leaking from the pneumothorax, hopefully form a clot, and then once the fibrin settles on that clot side, go ahead and you know, seal over so that it doesn't keep leaking air. Uh, normally, blood in the chest would stay in the fluid state, but if you have a leak, that leak has where is where oxygen is being leaked into the chest. Oxygen in contact with blood should create a clot. So that's the theory. It works about still doesn't work, you end up in surgery, but it's definitely worth trying, especially for people who are clients. Tons of data out in, in YouTube and all the textbooks. Um, you can either use Seldinger over the wire catheter, but this requires, you know, custom designed chest tubes. Um, if you don't have custom designed chest tubes for doing it over the wire, which is the easier way to do, then you can go ahead and just do uh, take a sterile tube. It can be red rubber, it can be polyethylene. It has to be pliable, flexible, sterile, and then you can just do a stab incision, place it with a Kelly or a cryl forcep, and then attach a you know Christmas tree and a three-way stop cock to get the chest drained. Then we go on to lung pathology. Um, in cats, asthma is the, one of the primary lung pathologies that we see. In dogs, we see a lot more pneumonias, and we see uh, pulmonary edema, cardi either cardiac or non-cardiogenic. And when it's not cardiogenic, it can be from right heart disease. It can be from a near drowning, a near choking event. It can be from electrocution, smoke inhalation, toxic exposure as well. All these guys who have primary lung disease need oxygen. As soon as they come into the hospital, as soon as they present to you, you have to get oxygen to them. Your options are going to be, if you have an oxygen cage big enough for the patient, put the patient in an oxygen cage. If you don't have that, you can do intranasal oxygen. Essentially, you would run an oxygen line either from a wall mount, an e-tank, or from the or from an anesthesia machine into a red rubber cannula that's going into the nose. Um, and then you would go on, if that alone is not enough, this is when technology starts to play a role. You would have to get either a high flow nasal oxygen cannula system. These high flow units will run up to 40 liters a minute. And at those higher levels, they provide a, a, some degree of continuous pos positive airway pressure. And because of the continuous positive airway pressure, it holds the lungs open. And because the lungs and the alveoli are kept open, your gas exchanges improved significantly. If you don't have high flow nasal oxygen, another option is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The biggest worry with hyperbaric oxygen therapy is fire. If you have an H hyperbaric oxygen system and you have somebody who is not careful using it, you can have catastrophic fires. There have been reports in the veterinary literature in the U.S. of people and animals dying because of inappropriate hyperbaric oxygen therapy use where fire uh, occurred and including the patient and the attending technician. So that's a big concern and you need a lot of training to make sure it's done correctly. And then obviously, Longer mechanical ventilation for lung disease is considered the gold standard, but we in the care community, even though we offer it to our clients, we think that long-term mechanical, mechanical ventilation for primary lung disease tends to carry a poor prognosis. So we would say that we, if we get between 15 and 20% of these patients off the ventilator at home, we're doing very, very well. So um, it's beyond the scope of the presentation, but you really have to talk, look at the client and look at the patient and make a decision, is it appropriate to put this patient on a ventilator before you go there? Some of the things that we have to remember in assessing airway and, and lung function is the alveolar, the PF ratio, and the AA gradient. 
the AA gradient is the difference in oxygen between the alveolar and the arterial oxygen. If you have normal lung function, the AA gradient should be somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. You have to have a blood gas analyzer to measure this gradient. And then if you have an abnormal AA gradient, if that AA gradient is getting into the 15s and 20s, you know that you have impaired gas exchange in the lung. The PF ratio, on the other hand, is a simpler way of looking at things. The big issue with the AA gradient is when you put a patient on oxygen, your AA gradient becomes not, not reliable. So if you have a patient who's on supplemental oxygen, the PF ratio is the better way to look at it. Remember that if your FiO2 or your fractional inspiration inspired oxygen is at room air, then in a normal lung, your PaO2 should be approximately four to four and a half times your FiO2. So when you're in room air, you, you're breathing 21% oxygen, your PaO2 should be somewhere in the 90s to 100 range. So then when you increase your FiO2, so when you're running a patient on 100% oxygen, their PaO2 should be somewhere in the 350 to 400 range. So if you have a PF ratio of less than 300, or a, you, you usually, it, it, it tells you that there's some degree of respiratory disease. And once you get below 200, you know you're in deep, deep trouble. Um, that number over 400 is considered pretty normal. So these indices of lung function are important for assessment. You have to know trends. One single measurement gives you no information at all. And so you have to be able to look at your PCO2, your ETO, ETO, entitled carbon dioxide, and your PaO2. And then when, when you cannot assess it just by the numbers, you can look at what's called work of breathing. This is the amount of effort that a patient is putting into breathing. The more work they're putting into breathing, the more quickly they're fatiguing the intercostal muscles in their diaphragm. And the other thing that happens is the more you work those muscles, you increase the amount of oxygen you have to deliver to those sites. And without intervention, these patients essentially die. So then, again, we go back to how do you help these patients? You have to put them on the ventilator. You have to take over their breathing. But you then have to you know, be careful because you put them on the ventilator, they're a little bit more stable. The next question is, how are you going to take them off? What are you going to do to make the lung better so that they can come off the ventilator? Because if you don't have an option to make the lung better, it doesn't matter how long they're on the ventilator, they never get off the ventilator. We, it's important to remember that if you take x-rays of these patients, the x-rays lag the lung pathology. So what you're seeing today on an x-ray is not as accurate as what you're going to see down the road. So fundamentally, the lung does not look as bad today as it will in a couple of days on x-ray. Um, similarly with CT scanning. And so the patient is more important than what the x-ray looks like. So you can have an x-ray with very little lung disease, but the patient is working really hard in a lot of trouble. That patient needs more intervention than if you have a patient who has fundamentally white white looking lungs on x-ray but their pulse oximetry is still in the 9900 range um, if the other option that you have for assessing lungs is a ct scan but ct scans require sedation and in the emergent presentation like when you have a true cardiopulmonary emergency we're not likely to use ct as a part of the emergent plan we're more likely going to consider um, doing that down the road where the patient is much more stable. So the things that we look that we worry about for lung function in an acute presentation is aspiration pneumonia. You can get a low bar consolidation in one area. You can get air bronchograms. That's pretty important. Um, if you don't see aspiration pneumonia. You, you can worry about things like non cardiac pulmonary edema. I, I apologize for the quality of this image. And you can always see feline asthma. So it's important to look at your lung and recognize the pattern you're seeing. 
For example, asthma patients tend to have hyperinflation. They have bronchial pattern in donuts. Um, this is not fundamentally a radiology session, but um, as you as you develop as clinicians, as the undergraduates develop as clinicians, they will get familiar with seeing these. Obviously, the postdocs need no uh, need no um, you know advice in this matter. They there are probably postdocs out there who are much better at reading radiographs than I am. Then we'll now go on to the cardiac conditions that I wanted to cover in this session. Uh, the most common cardiac disease that we see in the veterinary profession is mitral valve disease. And most of the time it's endocardiosis. It's not endocarditis. So the mitral valve has what's called myxomatous degeneration as time goes on. The valve flap becomes less flexible. The valve flap becomes more knobby. So it doesn't create a tight seal against the annulus. And because it doesn't create a tight seal, you have a leak. You essentially have a regurgitant leak when the heart beats. As time goes on, that regurgitant fraction gets bigger because the, the, the annulus starts to stretch. And as the regurgitant fraction gets bigger, even though the ventricle is working as hard as it can, less and less blood gets pushed into the aorta. And more blood gets pushed back into the left atrium. And over time, you you end up with pulmonary edema. Um, the regurgitant fraction decreases cardiac output, like we talked about. And this persistent hyperdynamic state. So what happens is when the body doesn't see enough blood getting to it, it creates upregulation of the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system. This makes the patient retain sodium, retain water. And because of sodium and water retention and compression or, or consumption, or uh, systemic vascular resistance, these patients have more and more um, hyperdynamic cardiac state. And then over time, your myofibrils, that is the, the structural functional element of the heart muscle, starts to drop out and they get remodeled, they get replaced with fibrous connective tissue, and then you get left ventricular hypertrophy and left atrial enlargement. So what you would see on an echocardiogram would be a thickened mitral valve, and you would see a large amount of uh, regurgitation right across where um, you see that where you see that area of thickening. Okay. So mitral valve disease patients usually present in fulminant failure, and you have to treat them right away, and you have to give them oxygen and IV furosemide, and the furosemide can either be given as a single dose, two to three milligrams per kilogram once as a push, or you can do a CRI. Um, once they can take oral agents, you start pemobendin. Pemobendin is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor um, and PDEI3 inhibitor. It's a positive inotrope, and it's also a lucitrope. It improves rela ventricular relaxation. And pemobendin has saved more lives than any other cardiac agent in veterinary medicine. In some countries, it's available as an IV infusion, so you can actually give it when the patient is in crisis. It's not available in the U.S. as an IV inf infusion. Pemobendin is expensive because it is still sold as a product that is protected under trademark. So if clients can't afford pemobendin, you can still use digitalis glycosides. Um, if you're using a digitalis glycoside, it's important to remember that there's a narrow therapeutic margin. It has to be monitored. And if a patient stops eating, we need to talk to the owners right away to figure out what's happening with the digitalis getting overdosed. Um, and then down the road, you add ACE inhibitors and spironolactone. Um, the concept of adding an ACE inhibitor is to create smooth muscle uh, relaxation, um, and the uh, concept of adding spironolactone is to antagonize the retin and aldosterone angiotensin system. Um, when you get pulmonary edema that's cardiogenic, it's much, much easier to diagnose it when you have cardiomegaly. The x-ray on your left has a big round heart. The trachea is a little bit elevated. That's pretty straightforward. Hey, this guy probably has some degree of heart failure. 
The one on the right, the cardiomegaly is much more subtle. And so it's important for those of you who use a vertebral heart score to be pretty accurate when you use your vertebral heart score because you can under you can underestimate cardiomegaly in tall dogs. If a dog that is relatively short, like a dachshund or a basset or a shih tzu, we tend to overestimate cardiomegaly. But in a tall dog, you tend to underestimate cardiomegaly. So it's important that you uh, either use a vertebral heart score or have a good sense of judgment as to whether a heart is big or not. Mitral valve disease, continuing down that process, the ones that fail traditional therapies, you can do what's called a Milrinone CRI. Um, and then the ones that are that make us the most successful are the ones when you have a patient that's near arrest. You can emergently intubate them with alfaxalone. Alfaxalone is available in the U.S. as an injection. Um, if it's not available in some of the countries that are participating, uh, you can use anything that is not uh, cardiotoxic, so do not use propofol, but you could definitely use etomidate if you needed to, to capture the airway, pass an endotracheal tube, and dump, literally physically and mechanically dump all the fluid in the lung. Uh, this mechanical removal of intrapulmonary and then you have to keep them on a ventilator for a short while. And these guys don't need long-term mechanical ventilation. And once you do that, their lungs start to inflate, their lungs start to function again. They're 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 much in they're much better to put them back in the stage, and now you're in better shape. You don't want to do this unless the patient is near death. So if you took a patient who's semi-stable and attempted to dump their lung water by intubating them, you're actually doing more harm than good. Patients with acute cordate tendon, tendon rupture do not have cardiomegaly, so it's really important to remember that you can have severe pulmonary edema without significant cardiomegaly and still be cardiac in origin, and these guys need a lot of care. Um, they, they will slowly get better, but it takes time for them to acclimate and accommodate to the new normal that they're living with. The American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine has classified mitral valve disease progression. Um, they've got a very, very good set of consensus statements on both canine and feline heart disease. And this is a resource that's free. It's available to everybody. I would strongly recommend you look at you, somebody. Everybody take a moment to look at it. So patients that are classified as A are the patients that are at risk. A Cavalier King Charles Spaniel would be classic. A B1 is a patient who has a mitral murmur, but this mitral murmur has not caused any changes at all. When the murmur starts to cause cardiac enlargement, they consider B2. When you have either a failure or a history of hospitalization, then they're at C1. When you have failure or history at home, in other words, they were hospitalized, they're sent home on meds, and they're still failing. They're at C2. And then the D1 and D2 are the refractory patients that are not doing well at all. And what we have to do is you have to echo these patients if you can. The quicker you get an echo, you get a baseline. You know how to treat them. The consensus statement tells you, for example, for A and B1, you hardly ever treat those patients. Uh, B2 onwards, you talk about treatment, and there's pros and cons to different drugs. The consensus statement lays it all out. Um, if you don't have an advanced echo system, if you don't have uh, pulse wave or color flow Doppler, just to the B and M modes, you can get most of the information you need. You cannot accurately stage these patients, but you can get the information to have a clinical impression of what to treat. Um, there's a very, very good textbook by June Boone called Veterinary Echocardiography. It's about 10, 11 years out now, um, but it's very, very, it's a very good resource. It's really easy to get. And then Colorado State University currently is looking at two different technologies for valve replacement. They're doing what's called a mitral seal, which is a apically introduced catheter and a trans catheter valve deployment through the left uh, ventricle into the uh, AV chamber, and they're also placing what's called a mitral clip, 
the mitral clip is being placed without an open procedure, whereas the mitral seal is being placed with a thoracotomy. Um, and both these procedures show a lot of promise. We're not at a point where it's, it's neither one of those can be offered commercially, but um, down the road, there's going to be some options for mitral valve disease. The next cardiac condition we're going to talk about is going to be pulmonary artery hypertension. This is severely underdiagnosed in veterinary medicine. The one good piece of information for the for the for the audience from Southeast India is this is a high altitude disease, and maybe one or two cases in the Nilgiris or in Kodi, but not not much more. Um, so it's less likely for, for this to be found in Southeast India. Um, heartworm disease can also cause this. Chronic airway disease, lung pathology can cause this. And these patients present with exercise intolerance. They can get syncopal. They can get cyanotic. The classic example is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or Westy lung disease. We see that quite often in Westies that are between 8 and 11 years of age. Um, we still don't understand why this is happening. The thought is that instead of being atopic, where the inhaled allergen causes skin lesions, these Westies, when they get this inhaled allergen into their lung, they're getting fibrosis uh, in the type 2 cells of the lung for some reason. Um, the important thing to remember with pulmonary artery hypertension is when you get cardiomegaly, you get what is called a reverse D. The heart is not in the classic enlarged on the left side uh, image, it's usually enlarged on the right side, you get more sternal contact. And then you have to have echocardiography to diagnose this process. Uh, you, and you need to have a regurgitation. If you can't find reg a regurgitant fraction with color flow Doppler, even though you may strongly suspect that a patient has pulmonary artery hypertension, it's almost impossible to quantify it or document it very well. In M-mode sequences, sometimes you can see paradoxical motion of the septal wall, and that also is a strong indicator that the pulmonary artery pressure is very, very high. Treatment is always palliative. You are never going to get the heart back to where it was. So there's two components to it. You treat the heart to try and improve cardiac function, reduce the pressure against which is reduce the pressure of the pulmonary artery. And then independent of that, you also have to treat any insult to the lung that's causing the lung to have fibrous changes develop over time. You will end up improving their exercise capacity. You will end up having them not turning cyanotic at home, but they still don't normalize. And so they don't live very long. They don't, it's funny, but patients with mitral valve disease actually live much, much longer than the patients with pulmonary artery hypertension. So treat the underlying pathology. If there's a pulmonary thrombosis, you have to address that, put them on low volume, uh, put them on something to break down the clot. If they have heart to home disease, treat that, get that under control. Um, sildenafil is a phosphodiase trace inhibitor. It's a PDEI5 agent, and this causes pulmonary artery smooth muscle relaxation. And because of that, it decreases the pulmonary artery hypertension. Um, then for the lung itself, bronchodilators, antifibrotics, anti-inflammatory therapies. You can also try hydralazine. And some people in human medicine use inhaled nitric oxide to get through the crisis. Um, we don't have it in our facility. Some facilities carry it. The primary cause of recompensation is hypoxia. And these patients, the really important thing to remember is even though they have heart disease and lung disease, these guys can present in bradycardia. They get syncope and cough. You want to give them oxygen. And this is why it becomes important to know what you're treating. You do not want to give them diuretics. When you have high pressure on the right side, when you have restriction of flow in the pulmonary parenchyma, you are not getting enough flow into the left atrium. And because of that, when you give these patients a diuretic, you further reduce the flow of the left atrium, and then you reduce, therefore, the aortic flow. And these patients actually do worse on a diuretic. And so you have to be very, very careful to try and identify which patients require uh, you know, therapy with furosemide versus which patients you want to try and avoid furosemide. 
The next patient we're going to talk about is pericardial effusion. Um, the next condition we're talking about is pericardial effusion. These guys all present similarly with collapse, weakness, lethargy. Interestingly enough, approximately 60% of patients with pericardial effusion show some signs of nausea or vomition, even though the GI tract is not involved. Um, they all invariably have low output heart failure. The tamponade is caused by intrapericardial fluid or restriction exceeding the right atrial pressure. With the increased right atrial pressure, flow from the cava doesn't go to the heart. And these patients going to go, because of low venous return, have no forward output, and then they go into failure. These patients do not have pulmonary edema. And these patients, if they're chronic, will, they will develop pleural effusion, ascites, along with the pericardial effusion. So you would see a globoid heart and pericardial effusion. You'll see uh, contact on both sides of the chest and elevation of the trachea. The lungs are, lung fields are almost always completely clear. And then when you look at this echocardiograph image, you can see tamponade where normally you would have to have, we were, normally you'd have a nice open right atrium. In this case, the right atrium is bowed in. So you've got a pericardial effusion, both your ventricles, and a bowed in right atrium. So clinical findings with pericardial effusion, you can see jugular pulses. So if you hold the neck up and just watch for a minute, you can see the jugular veins pulse. Um, and for those who uh, have worked with cattle, you'll see this also when you have traumatic uh, pericarditis from a wire that's, tra which, that's transiting through. Um, you can see electrical alternance. This is an EKG finding. Um, if you hook them up to EKG and keep them sternal or keep them standing, the heart will go from side to side in its fluid sac with each contraction. This will cause variation in size of the QRS complex. Um, and so if you see electrical alternance, you pretty much know you have a pericardial effusion. The heart sounds are muffled. You always have weak pulses. Um, and what we do is we give them some oxygen. I don't know that the oxygen makes the patient much more stable, but it makes us feel better. Um, we give them a little bit of energy sedation. Butorphanol is what we usually reach for. And then we create pericardio. We do a pericardiosynthesis. And having ultrasound makes it much, much easier. There's a debate over the left versus the right side. Most veterinary textbooks will tell you to tap the pericardium on the left side. This is a holdover from the human literature. Um, sorry, most, per, this is, most of them will tell you to tap it on the right side. And this is a holdover from the human literature because in human medicine, you can accidentally lacerate the coronary artery tapping a pericardium. And if you lacerate the coronary artery, you'd have catastrophic co consequences. In veterinary medicine, the odds of elastating coronary artery are not very high, and the right ventricle is much, much thinner than the left ventricle. So I personally tend to tap them on the left side, but I use ultrasound so I can see and make sure I'm not accidentally puncturing a lung on my way through to the pericardium. Uh, perform them in sternal recumbency, and if you make a tiny little hole in the pericardium, most of the blood will drain out. So even if you start draining it and the dog moves, that alone, that little needle hole in the pericardium draining, where you started the drainage, will allow most of the blood to drain out, and that patient will most likely survive. Once you have drained the pericardial effusion, the patient's more stable, you have to define the cause. If you can't find a hemangiosarcoma on ultrasound, you can run a troponin I. Troponin I is elevated in a hemangiosarcoma, even if you don't see a mass. Um, do a complete echocardiogram, make sure there's nothing else going on. And then we perform thoracoscopic pericardial windows. Uh, some facilities will have a surgeon go in and just do a subtotal pericardectomy below the level of the phrenic nerve. Um, if there's a right atrial mass that you can staple it off, that will help these patients. Um, and then there's some patients that just get managed with periodic synthesis or you use a balloon and you dilate the balloon at the pericardial wall and tear the pericardial wall into a big hole. And by doing that, you prevent it from closing over as quickly. And then coming up towards some of the other uh, conditions that we see, we see dilated cardiomyopathy quite off often. And the interesting thing about cardio dilated cardiomyopathy is
We used to see a lot of these present primarily because of poor genetics. Now we have other causes for it. They all present in low output heart failure. They have cardiomegaly pulmonary edema. And you can actually have a hard time telling an advanced end stage mitral valve patient from a classic dilated cardiomyopathy patient. The ventricular wall should be thin. The fracture shortening should be decreased. Prognosis is dependent on the underlying cause. So when you have a DCM, what happens is over time, the heart remodels. As you can tell, the ventricular walls thin out quite a bit. And so you just have this big floppy heart. The gold standard for therapy is pemobendin. The second choice is digital glycosides. Uh, but the one thing that people forget about digitalis is it actually can slow down the heart rate a little bit. And that's a huge benefit. So in some cases, I use pemobendin. If pemobendin alone is not enough, I'll come back with low-dose digitalis. I'm not using it as a pure inotrope. I'm using it as a negative chronotrope to slow down the heart rate. Diuretics. Primary lactone a secondary ACE inhibition, um, anti-RAAS system agent, spironolactone is the primary agent. Um, we, we hardly ever use losartan or telmisartan. In Europe, it's being used a lot more. Um, but in, in our practice, we use those drugs more for proteinuria as opposed to for cardiac disease. And then, obviously, if there's a rhythm disturbance, that has to be controlled with either deltaism or maxillotine or sotalol, depending on the Some patients with DCM have PCs. Some will have atrial fibrillation, and some will have tachyarrhythmias. Your ventricular rate should be somewhere between 120 and 160, because if you reduce the rate, you improve. We talked about this in the very beginning. You improve filling time. You improve cardiac output. And your ventricular oxygen delivery, so the amount of oxygen you you perfuse the ventricle with is dependent on the difference between the aortic diastolic pressure and the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So the ventricle gets oxygen not when it's in systole, but the ventricle gets oxygen when it's actually relaxing. So it has pushed oxygen into the aorta and now it's relaxing, so the leftover blood in the aorta gets into the coronary arteries. And when that is happening, um, you need to have a, a, a decent pressure differential to get um, adequate oxygen to the ventricles. The higher the rate, the less oxygen you deliver to the ventricles, so that's a big concern. The rhythms that we talked about, uh, the biggest issue that we have is that if you get something called R on T, this can lead to sudden cardiac death. So when you have an EKG, your QRS complex is followed by a T waveform. The T is when you have the repolarization of the heart. If the rate gets really, really fast and an R falls right on top of a T, you will go into coarse ventricular fibrillation. And once you're in coarse V-fib, unless you get electrically shocked, there is no coming back from that process. Holter monitoring is extremely important in these patients. Once you've gotten them more stable, you want to put a Holter monitor on them because you want to identify any rhythm. And rhythms are not always, rhythm disturbances are not always seen on a five-minute lead to strip. So what you have to do is put a Holter monitor on them, send them home, get a 24 or 48-hour ass assessment. Um, if you find the rhythm disturbance and you put them on the right meds, the sudden cardiac death issue goes away. And these Holter monitors are commercially available. We just put them on with a couple of stick-on pads, electrode pads to the patient, put a T-shirt on the patient, put the monitor on the T-shirt, send them home. And then the owners bring the dog back 24 or 48 hours later, unhook the monitor, and then we just send the monitor by, we ship the monitor back. It, rem it remembers everything on a little chip. And then the chip gets unloaded, downloaded onto a computer, the computer actually has a program that looks at all the rate disturbances, rhythm disturbances, picks them out, and then you get a complete cardiology review and report back. Holter monitoring will actually detect DCM before echocardiogram, before troponin I measurements, before uh, C-reactive protein. So the Holter monitor is the most accurate way to find early DCM in suspect breeds.
In the U.S., there's been a big problem with DCM that started recently in the past four or five years. It's been identified as being associated with exotic and grain-free pet foods. Um, we don't know why. We thought it was taurine deficiency. Blood, blood and uh, cardiac taurine levels have been normal. We thought that this might be related to peas or legumes. Haven't been able to prove that link very well. Um, but it's reversible. So the good news is a lot of DCM patients that are on grain-free diets, if you can get them through the crisis, will actually survive forever, will go back to normal. Um, but we do not at this point in time understand the mechanism of why this happened. So this is something that there are a lot of nutritionists still working on the process. Um, and then we used to put them on dobutamine. That's gone away. It's fallen out of favor. Uh, 72 hours of dobutamine in ICU gets very, very expensive. And it seems like with pemobendin being available, the dobutamine CRIs have not been required. But if we end up with a patient that's failing everything, uh, one last resort is you could put them on five to seven and a half mics per kilo per minute of dobutamine for 72 hours and see if that leaves some improvement, residual improvement in ventricular function. Uh, remember that when you're doing this dobutamine CRI to use the least amount of fluids possible, so you're giving uh, 100-pound Doberman something like 5-6 ml an hour in order to get the dobutamine into him. So you're, you're doing a very, very low-volume infusion. Um, and then blood pressure monitoring is extremely important because if you can't maintain the mean arterial pressure, the systolic blood pressure over 60, your renal perfusion starts to drop and then you'll end up with renal injury. Once you have renal injury, you're kind of in a lot of trouble because you can't use diuretics. So when you have a sick cardiac patient with low output failure, you have to monitor the blood pressure while they're, there, while they're in the hospital. Uh, the familial cardiomyopathy patients usually live about six to 18 months after diagnosis. The arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, this includes the boxer cardiomyopathy, the right ventricular arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and the slow AFib patients, these guys actually will live much, much longer. They will live years sometimes if they respond well to therapy. Cardiomyopathy with diet is reversible, and cardiomyopathy with infectious disease, if you can treat the infectious disease, they go back to being normal. Uh, in the U.S., Bartonella is the number one cause of infectious cardiomyopathies. It's tick-borne. Uh, I'm not sure what is endemic at this point in time in India. Feline cardiomyopathies almost always present in heart failure. Um, when they're present in heart failure, interestingly enough, bradycardia is noted. They're almost always hypothermic because they go into core body circulation. They don't maintain good flow to their, to their rectal mucosa and their feet. And if there's an aortic thromboembolism, they get significant pain in vocalization. Um, give me one quick second. And then uh, you have what is called an aortic thromboembolism. It can affect one limb or a saddle thrombus if it's both limbs. And it really depends on how committed these owners are to the cats. Some owners treat cats as you know, part of the family. Other owners treat cats as something that they feed while it's in, you know, while it's in the yard or the outside. So you, if you're going to treat a cat with cardiomyopathy, it has to be a cat that the owner can medicate multiple times a day. Uh, again, there's an ACBM consensus statement on feline cardiomyopathy. The progression is linked to classification in a clearly demarcated manner. Um, some cats will have a murmur will be diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and never change. And then, the, so the important thing is, <clears throat> if you hear a murmur in a cat, it has to be assessed like a murmur in a dog. It used to be that we would go, oh, cats with murmurs all have bad disease. No, they don't. Some cats can have fundamentally innocent murmurs. They can have rate-dependent systolic murmurs. They can have uh, left ventricular outflow tract or right ventricular outflow tract dynamic murmurs that can pretty much be ignored. Um, cats live eight to three months, uh, eight months to three years for median survival time after the first CHF event, depending on which author you read. Cats with aortic thromboembolism have a greater than 60% recurrence rate despite being on medications. 
and the cats with aortic thromboembolism will require long, long-term anticoagulation. We used to put them on aspirin, warfarin. About 10 years ago, no, 15, 12 years ago, after the fat cat study, we put them on clopidrogo, and now we're starting to look at rivaroxaban and apaxaban as options. So the ACVM consensus statement pretty much says some cats are predisposed, like a Norwegian forest cat or a sphinx, and then when you have atrial enlargement, you can the subclinical, you call them B1. When the atrium starts to get much bigger, they're B2. And then obviously Cs and Ds are the ones in trouble. Emergency therapy is very similar. Oxygen support, minimal stress, analgesia, butorphanol if they're anxious. Furosemide is going to be their first drug of choice for all of those in failure. Pemobendin if they're in a low output state. And then Diltiazem as a calcium channel blocker to decrease the heart rate. Beta blockers used to be in favor for patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. The negative cardiac output effects have, see, have seen them come out of favor at this point in time, but there's still some veterinary cardiologists who use beta blockers. The emergency therapy for these guys when they have a thromboembolic event is analgesia. If you don't give them analgesics, their stress levels keep rising and they keep getting worse with time. So start them with pain control. And then once you have pain control and oxygen on board, treat the underlying cardiac disease and then talk about thromboembolic tissue uh, therapy. If you do use tissue plasminogen activator or streptokinase, these are injectable. The big issue with these, with these drugs is that you're dissolving the clot. When you dissolve the clot, you create reperfusion and reperfusion can sometimes present as hyperkalemia and acute death. So most veterinary practices, most specialty hospitals have gone away from the injectable agents and are now looking at either oral or uh, selective drugs like the anti-10A drugs like rivaroxaban or apaxaban. Uh, platelet aggregation inhibitors like clopidogrel or aspirin are also used. Warfarin is a generalized anticoagulant. It knocks out all the serine proteases. So the big downside of warfarin is there's a higher risk of bleeding. And there's always concern for reperfusion with patients who have thromboembolic events. And then the important thing with uh, aortic thromboembolism is that because they, it occurs because of the low atrial flow state and volume overload. Uh, the, when there's no flow in the atrium, the blood just sits there and over time starts to aggregate platelets, and this is seen as smoke. These left atrium aggregates can form a clot or a thrombus. If that clot or thrombus breaks free, it gets pushed into the aorta, and then it, uh, it can occlude the iliac branches and form a saddle thrombus. All the therapy for uh, aortic thromboembolic cats is directed at platelet inhibition or formation or inhibition of the formation of a strong clot. So on an, this, is an, this is a left atrium with an oracle. There's a huge amount of echogenic material in the chamber. Uh, this is classic for spontaneous echogenic contrast or smoke. The big worry with arrhythmias at this stage, and we're not talking about the dilated or the uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy cats, we're talking about just any, any patient, any small animal patient, is arrhythmias affect filling time. So if you have a tachyarrhythmia and your filling time gets decreased, you get poor stroke volumes, your myocardial oxygen consumption exceeds your myocardial oxygen delivery, and then this leads to acidosis. Once your myocardium is in an acidotic state, it gets prone to gain remembrances, and then you end up sudden death or you'll end up with dilation of the heart. So everybody can recognize a normal sinus rhythm, this is classic for a supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, and then what you'll see, this is in patients that have, you know, mostly in larger breed dogs, retriever type dogs. Um, dogs, it can occur with toxicities, methyl xanthine, that is chocolate is a good example. Uh, speed or, uh, you know, amphetamine is a good example for creating supraventricular tachycardia. It can be secondary to increased irritability of the atrial wall. And you can get re-entry phenomenon. So a good example of a supraventricular tachycardia that's 
innate to a patient and not related to a toxicity is for some reason there's a tiny amount of trauma or injury to an atrial wall and then an accessory pathway is set up. The SA node fires the SA node firing then leads to AV node activation, and then the AV node, instead of activating down the bundle of his, unfortunately also sends a secondary signal into a different part of the atrium that re innervates the SA node. So you have for every beat, you create another beat, and that becomes a vicious cycle, and very, very quickly you develop a tachycardia that leads to death. <coughs> you can get um, these patients present in a trembling, agitated state, they're weak, um, and you usually don't see congestive heart failure because it's so rapid in its progression. Treatment, make a diagnosis off of your ECG. You can do a vagal maneuver. So your thumb on both eyeballs, try and increase the vagal nerve stimulation, see if you can get to the cycle to break. If that doesn't work, then you have to go to a beta blocker. Propranol, etanolol are the first drugs used. You can also try diltiazem or digoxin. Um, Long-term management, we usually keep them on etanolol or sotalol, and we know that rate reduction improves cardiac performance. If there's a re-entry pathway, you need to electroablate it. So this would mean that you would have to go to a cardiology facility that has electrophysiology available. They can then map the heart and based on the cardiac mapping, they can go in with a selective electrode transvenously and then just literally do a small little shock and burn off the accessory pathway. When you get a ventricular tachycardia, they can be because they're genetically predisposed. You can also get VTACs from medical conditions. After a splenectomy, after hypovolemic shock, you can get VTAC from myocardial irritability. You have to correct the volume status and electrolytes as soon as possible, and then you follow up with lidocaine bolus and CRI. If that doesn't work, then you go to procainamide. Classic example of VTAC, as everybody knows to recognize. Um, it's seen more commonly in boxers, bulldogs, and German shepherds. Uh, we don't understand why. Um, and VTAC is one of those cases where you can get pulmonary edema from prolonged tachycardia state. Sudden death is because of R on T phenomenon that, phenomenon that we've discussed. They should be on continuous ECG monitoring during the hospitalization. When you give them lidocaine, a lot of these guys will, con will convert from a VTAC to an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. So if they have an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, what's happening is the heart is ignoring the atrial signaling and is just beating in a regular manner, in the in a heart rate of 120 to 160, and that's a that's a survivable rhythm. If you try to control an accelerated idioventricular rhythm by giving them more antiarrhythmics, you can ablate, or you can get rid of that rhythm, and then you're left with no heartbeat at all. So it's really important not to increase the dosage of the antiarrhythmic when you've gotten to an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. At that stage, you just manage them, and then you convert them from injectable lidocaine to oral maxillotine. You get them home, you bring them back in a couple weeks, and then you see if they still have an AIR or if they've gone back to normal sinus rhythm. Um, when you have bradyarrhythmias, you, it can be either because there's primary heart disease or because of excess vagal tone. Um, these guys present with uh, syncopal episodes. Congestive failure is extremely rare. Uh, you're, you identify whether they're vagal or non-vagal by doing what's called an atropine response test. You hook up a patient to an EKG. You give them a dose of atropine. It's usually one ml per 20 kilos of body weight. And then you wait Remember that when you give atropine, you will actually get a very transient dip in the heart rate before you get the atropine response. So don't just see the dip and go, oh, it didn't respond. Give them enough time. It can take up to four or five minutes sometimes after IV atropine to see a good response. And then if your heart rate goes up over 120 or 150, you know that they're responding to atropine, so the vagal nerve is not playing a role. I mean, the vagal nerve is playing a role. These guys will not need intervention. On the other hand, if 
the vagal nerve is not playing a role, you will need to do something for these patients. Um, you can, if you have a patient who has a slow heart rate, a bradyarrhythmia from six sinus syndrome, sometimes owners will say, I can't afford a pacemaker. And then you can try putting them on propantheline bromide. This is an essentially an antiparasympathetic agent, but you're going to give it on the hope that you're going to keep the rate a little bit higher. So if you can keep the rate in the 60s, patients less likely to have syncope as opposed to the 40s. Theophylline can also do something similar. Giving oral theophylline increases your cyclic AMP. This might improve cardiac performance just enough for them to survive. And then if they're willing to hospitalize, a CRI of, CRI of isoproteranol is the gold standard. It'll bring, up the, it'll bring up the ventricular rate very nicely into the 90s. Dopamine is not as effective, but can also be tried. The use of CRI makes it safer for your anesthesia for pacemaker implantation. Um, you can also do what's called transthoracic pacing, where your defibrillator has pacing leads that you attach to the chest on both sides. But if you're doing transthoracic patient pacing, the patient has to be anesthetized with a fentanyl CRI because it's painful. You're actually giving a huge jolt or shock every second or, or maybe every three quarters of a second across the thoracic wall to get the heart to beat. And that's very, very uncomfortable. So these patients that are on transthoracic pacers have to be sedated or on an analgesia CRI. Um, once you have made a decision to put in a pacer, we tend to put them in transvenously if we can. Um, if we have a patient who's previously had jugular vein injury for some reason or has a comorbidity, like a cable problem, or has an issue with, say, a small body mass, a ferret or a small cat, we don't put, we don't put in transvenous leads, we put in abdominal, lead, uh, abdominal epicardial lead systems. And modern pacemakers have learning modes. So the older pacemakers, you fixed heart rate, you fixed your impulse size, and therefore you had a fixed amount of survival time given to the patient. The newer pacemakers have detection capacity, and they will, over time, reduce the amount of shock they're giving to the heart so that they can extend their battery life as much as possible. Uh, in veterinary medicine, nobody is doing a lot of ICD implantations at this time. There are few facilities that do it on a selective basis um, if you have uh, really dynamic rhythms that cause sudden arrest all the time. So when you, have an echo, when you have a transvenous lead, this is what it looks like. And then when you have an epicardial lead, that's what it looks like. Uh, both of these te technologies are fairly straightforward and available across the board. The other things that I want to talk about briefly in this particular subject is for those of you who are interested, you should read the Recover Project Initiative. You should try and get Recover certified. CPCR in dogs and cats was always based on the human data. In 2010, ACVEC and VECCS created an initiative that looked at all the data involving CPR in veterinary medicine. Based on their analysis, they came up with what are called best practices, optimal outcomes codifications. And to this day, even though we're doing what is considered best practices, we still have very poor discharge from hospital rates for CPCR. The arrests associated with an anesthesia complication, the patients that arrest because an animal had, uh, for example, somebody give an induction agent too fast, those animals almost always survive. Uh, but the patients that arrest because they had underlying metabolic disease, like say a pancreatic patient who dies, even if you get them back, the metabolic disease does not go away. And therefore the issue is, that they tend to have still have uh, very poor discharge from hospital, hospital arrest. Um, Recover 2 is currently in progress, so the data sets are going to get modified in the near future, and then new data and new certifications are going to come out. Um, most of this training can be done online. Institutions and groups get very big discounts since the initiative is a nonprofit, so um, you could talk to your local groups, whichever groups you're affiliated with, have them contact Recover, 
do most of the online training uh, for, for the group at very little cost. The advanced training and the instructor certification requires hands-on time, and that's pretty much uh, left up to the individual uh, facilities as to whether they want to pay for an instructor or you know go through the process of sending somebody out to get instructor certified and then bring it back to their facility. Remember when we're monitoring these guys in CPCR that the end tidal capnometer is the most important monitor to use um, the, because the low end tidal volumes implies that you're not getting enough carbon dioxide presented by the blood to the lung. Your normal ETCO2 should be between 35 and 45. And if you have high ETCO2, you know that you're dealing with ventilation failure. When you talk about pulse oximetry, which is what people tend to reach for because it's more convenient, it's an indicator of oxygen saturation. And it's based on the difference in wavelength between the oxygenated and non-oxygenated heme molecule. And you, you need to have a pulse waveform for this to work. The problem with pulse oximetry is you need a PaO2 of 60% to survive. And these patients at 60% should have an oxygen saturation of 90% based on how your curve runs. And so the big issue with these is that if these patients are on 100% oxygen, their saturation should be very, very high. And if their saturation is 90 when they're on 100% oxygen, you know that they're in trouble. So pulse oximetry is not as sensitive as entitled CO2. Lastly, we'll talk about VQ mismatches. Um, if you have a patient that's trying to die and you're not sure why, remember you can have two different levels of mass exchange impairment. You can get what's called either a shunt or a physiologic dead space. In a shunt, fundamentally what happens is you're getting no air into one set of lung fields. So, for example, if you have a lung that is full of fluid from pneumonia, you're ventilating your right lung, not ventilating your left lung, you're still taking blood, you're still distributing blood to both the right and the left lungs. So when you collect this blood and bring it back to the left atrium, you're bringing back blood that is only partially oxygenated. And this is called a shunt situation. On the other hand, if you have a big blood clot affecting one of the branches of the pulmonary artery, even though the alveolus is perfectly fine, is, in, is expanded, has air moving through it, is capable of gas exchange, there is no blood being presented to the capillary side of the alveolus, there's no gas exchange occurring. So even though there is oxygenated blood getting back to the patient, the patient is still deficient of oxygen blood, oxygenated blood because of sheer blood volume. So the important thing with shunts and VQ mismatches is that you have to know which, what condition you're dealing with. Shunt fraction is the percentage of alveolar that is not functioning appropriately. And a really good way to figure out if a shunt fraction is at 50% is you get a pulse oximeter on a patient, say it reads 91 or 88 or whatever, and then you put a face mask oxygen on the same patient, you get another pulse oximeter reading. If the pulse oximetry reading does not improve, then what you're being told by, the, by that data is that the shunt fraction exceeds 50%. Further oxygenation is not going to help this patient. The only thing that's going to help this patient is to consider an extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. On the other hand, if you have a lot of physiologic dead space and you have a venous thrombus, a pulmonary venous thrombus, you have to get rid of the thrombus. You cannot, giving these patients more oxygen might help oxygenate the blood that is being oxygenated, but it's not significant. The, what you really need to do is try and improve flow through the lung, and most of these patients get put on low molecular weight heparin. Um, and, and you just wait them out. Usually it takes uh, three to five days for that to get better. Um, if you have a large PTE causing physiologic dead space, these patients die suddenly. If you have a small PTE, um, you can manage them three to seven days before they get better. Um, and CT scan is the only way to document a PTE in the lung fields. Um, we don't treat our... Most of our PTEs do not get imaged because 
we know there's an underlying cause. They've had a recent surgery. They've had a re recent trauma. They have explained the PTE. And there's no value to ventilating a PTE patient. The issue is not the alveolar side. The issue is the vascular side. I would like to thank Dr. Arun Prasad for inviting me to do this. I would like to uh, treat the entire uh, group at Alembic who are doing the IT for this process, Tanuas, my colleagues and mentors. And this is a huge, huge subject. So I've pretty much skimmed what I think are the most important components of it. So I want to do a, a fairly extensive question and answer session. So if um, there are any questions, I would entertain them. Any questions, sir? Yeah, Dr. Ravi Shastri, that was a very good, interesting uh, webinar. We all enjoyed it. Hope the, the participant also have enjoyed it. And thank you very much for the nice uh, class. And to recap, and the number of registration is uh, 1,085, of which uh, 1,000... 53 are from India, and the other participants are from Malaysia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Poland, Sri Lanka, Italia, Qatar, and uh, Taiwan. So there is a very good participation, and uh, uh, 705 are on online. So it's a very good uh, that these people are on online. And many yeah. of the questions are being answered by our, the honorable speaker. Uh, of course, some uh, questions are repeatedly raised. I yeah. think I will place those questions to uh, uh, Dr. Ravi. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, in fact, I, I, I enjoyed this, uh, this stunt in the tracheal collapse. Okay. Was, <laughs> because I was doing a lot of endoscope. I enjoyed this, uh, this slide. Uh -huh. uh, going on to the, the questions, some of the questions. Uh, can you please uh, explain the vagal maneuver once again for the benefit sure. that, that two to three or four people have asked? That's why I'm putting on to you. Okay. So fundamentally, when you have a supraventricular tachycardia, the heart rate is the heart rate is extremely high, and the, are you okay? Yes. Yes. Can we are following. Me? Can you hear me? We are following you. Yes, we are able to okay. hear. So fundamentally, when you have a very high heart rate, if you increase the vagal tone, you can decrease the heart rate. In order to decrease the heart rate, you can go ahead and do anything that increases the vagal tone. And so if you make a dog vomit, for example, the vagal tone increases. If, but nobody wants to take an unstable dog and give it an apomorphine injection to make it vomit. So the simplest thing to do, which is very reversible, is to just extend the head and neck of the patient and then standing behind the patient with, with your thumbs, put gentle pressure on both the eyes. You're not putting enough pressure to hurt the patient. You're putting enough pressure to just push the globes back into the socket a little bit. And that... The nerve will hopefully slow down the heart rate. If there's no response to vagal maneuver, you have to go to pharmacological intervention. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question, how to differentiate the bleeding from the nose, whether it is due to trauma or infectious cause? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> if I have an epistaxis patient, um, it's a, it's a, um, the first thing that I do with an epistaxis patient is I actually get a blood pressure on them. Dogs can have nosebleeds from high pressure, and so that's an easy thing to do. If the blood pressure is normal, I look at their coags. If their coags are abnormal, then I treat the underlying coagulopathy. Um, I look at the platelet count. I look at the PTPTT. If those are normal, then the big question, like the like the like the like it was asked is you know do you look for ehrlichia do you look for aspergillosis or do you actually worry about trauma and it really 
without a CT scan, it's hard to tell. Um, you can definitely consider anesthesia and endoscopy, but it won't be as effective as a CT scan because there are parts of the nose that you can't reach with the scope. Yes. Um, thank you very much. How to manage a cat presented with the subcutaneous emphysema associated with trauma? Okay. That's actually a very, very good question. And um, I have a few pearls of wisdom for this one. So the first thing with these cats is you take a chest X-ray. If they have a pneumomediastinum and not a pneumothorax, then the trauma is cervical trachea. If the chest X-ray shows a pneumothorax, then the trauma involves the thoracic inlet and the chest. So for the patients that just have cervical tracheal injury, you can keep them in oxygen, drain the sub-Q air, and give them 24 hours to see if it seals. If it doesn't seal, then you can do a surgical repair. You anesthetize the patient, uh, put in a relatively small endotracheal tube, um, put them in dorsal recumbency, shave their neck, expose the trachea, put a little bit of sterile saline, hand ventilate, see where the leak is, and then you can close it with suture. Um, Four-odd suture, simple, inter simple interrupted pattern, and then routine closure. These cats do very, very well. The cats that have intrathoracic tears are much more challenging. Uh, they will need a chest tube, and not only will they need a chest tube, if the tear doesn't seal on its own, when you explore these cats, you're going to have to do a median sternotomy to, to get to the rest of the trachea. And the big issue with the median sternotomy is the common brachycephalic runs very, very close to the manubrium. And so you have to be very careful because if you lacerate the common brachycephalic, you can lose blood supply to the limb. So um, these are more tricky. So the cats that have classic tracheal tear worse than the cats that have a cervical tracheal tear. Yeah, thank you very much. So my next question, what is the steps to be taken in a dog with a traumatic injury, having a broken rib and a pulmonary hemorrhage? Um, I, I tend to block the affected rib. So the biggest issue with these guys, when they have a pulmonary contusion and they have a fractured rib, is their ventilation is affected either from pain or from lung function. So if it's affected from pain, my perspective with these patients is to go ahead and block the rib. I use bupivacaine at the rib head injectable. And then once the rib heads are blocked and they're on analgesics, I see how well they're ventilating. And then supplemental oxygen that these guys have to go to immediate surgery. Um, on the other hand, if the lung contusions are so bad that the patient is decompensating, then you have to reach for high flow oxygen to keep the alveoli recruited under longer for a longer time. Thank you very much for the patient's reply for the, the questions raised by the participants. Yeah, we are coming to the, the concluding session. Uh, I am okay. the vote of thanks. I have an immense pleasure in proposing vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee. At the outset, we are the utmost thankful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. K. N. Sello Kumar, who was instrumental for uh, and provided every support and encouragement for the conduct of the this global webinar. Thank you very much, sir. We need to mention. Uh, our Director of Clinics, Dr. S. Palasubramaniam, who is the initiative for all this webinar we have been undertaking for the past one year, even during COVID-19. And uh, he supported us in every aspect, right from the preparation of the, uh, the flyer to the conduct of the webinar. We are very grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. The most important being the, the international speaker, Dr. Ravi Shashadri, who has uh, spared his valuable time in, in spite of his busy practice and uh, shared his knowledge for the benefit of our students and the practitioners.
Thank you, Dr. Ravi Shastri, for on behalf of the organizing committee. Thank you very much. Yeah, perfect. You're Ravi, welcome, sir. It was it was a you. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I take this chance uh, to mention, rather request Dr. Ravi Shastri, we may be disturbing you again for uh, maybe another session to have a. a brainstorming session with exclusively for the pg students of medicine and surgery absolutely i'll be, I'll be glad i mean i'll be well we can yeah, do and ask me anything it'll be fun yeah thank you thank you so much and i express uh, thanks for the dean for providing this uh, uh, audio visual aid and the the lecture lecture all for the use of the webinar I, I, last but the least i thank everyone and the importance to be mentioned is dr vijay anand assistant professor of uh, resident veterinary service sections dr tirunav karasu who is uh, it instrumental in conducting this uh, webinar thank you one and all thank you